Girling House. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, we, we like to say that we are a okay. Um, good to be back with you this morning. We're going to pick up. Um, thank you for moving this up here, folks in the back. Um, hasn't our tech crew been amazing? So, they, they, they have done a great deal to accommodate me this week, and I'm grateful for that. Um, so thank you to them. So yeah, yesterday we were talking about loss and how loss impacts our congregations, how we respond to and think about loss. I want to today spend just a few minutes kind of wrapping up some thoughts from that, uh, from the first presentation, talk a little bit about grief, and then go on to talk about nostalgia and yearning and how our sense of the past can begin to inform how we move into the future. So let's first go to um, talk a little bit about grief. Okay, wrong one. There, now I'm going. As I said yesterday, change always results in some sense of loss, and loss always results in some level of grief. And of course, we have experienced in our lives and in our congregations a great deal of loss, not just because of COVID, but even going beyond that, churches have been in decline in this country since the mid-60s. I mean, if you look at the downward trend of population in terms of religious participation across the board, not just amongst us Lutherans, that line has been in a steady decline since, what, 50, 60 years ago. It's only maybe recently that we've started to notice it, and by recently I mean probably in the last 20 years, but even in the 1970s there were scholars and thinkers who were saying the church is in decline, we need to figure out what that's about. Mostly they weren't listened to. So, we are communities that are grieving, and the only way through grief is to grieve. The only way through grief is to grieve. The problem with that is that we live in a death-denying culture. We used to say that we lived in a death, def or I'd say that wrong, strike that back up. We live in a death-defying culture. There, that's better. We've often said that we lived in a death-denying culture, but I think it's really more intense than that. We pretend as culture, and I'm, here I'm talking about mainstream American culture, there are other cultures within the American context that do this much, much, much better than those who trace our cultural roots into um, Europe. But we, we go around pretending like death doesn't happen. And then we act when death does come like somehow it's a failure or a mistake or something that's just not right. I mean, I've heard people say, if somebody was 105 years old, I can't believe they died. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, it was um, qu quite a number of years ago, even before I was bishop, I was listening to one of the uh, morning news programs. I don't remember which network it was on. But there was a doctor on there, and she was talking about something we either had to do or not do um, to be healthier, and she said that if you do this or don't do this, because I don't remember anymore, she said, this will reduce your chances of death by 100%. <laughs> and I thought, oh, oh sh she misspoke. I mean, she had to have misspoke. Well, then a few weeks later, I was listening to NPR. Yeah, I do listen to NPR. And there was another doctor on there, and that doctor too said, if you do this or don't do this, it will reduce your chances of death by 100%. And I went, what? As far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm aware, our chances of death as human beings is 100%. <laughs> and so we've seen all sorts of things that have happened in our, in our culture just in the last 20 or 30 years, the rise of celebrations of life instead of funerals. Funerals without a body present, 
I remember the first time I went to a graveside service, and we didn't even go to the graveside. We went to a interment chapel, and then the body just sort of disappeared at the end. The only way through grief is to grieve. And we do all sorts of things to avoid that. I mean, we have the funeral, and then, you know, even if we've lost somebody deeply significant to us, you know, two weeks later, people can't figure out why we're not back to normal. You know, our grief period, in many cultures, the grief period lasts at least a year when people understand that we're trying to work through our sense of grief and loss. So let's talk just a little bit about what it means to grieve. The first thing that we need to realize is that we don't think about grief the way we once did. How many of you can name Elizabeth, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief? Okay, handful of you, good. Maybe it's fading from our consciousness. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was one of the pioneers of, our, of the field of thanatology, study of death and dying. She discovered five common experiences that people have but they're not stages. You don't do them in order. I don't know, I still hear people say, I must not be doing this right because I'm, my stages are out of order. I should be doing this stage and I should... Even Kuba Ross, by the end of her life and the end of her work, said, no, they're not stages. They're five common experiences. And so, in more recent years, like in the last three decades, um, that's why I say new ways of thinking about death and dying, or of grief and loss, we talk more about tasks. What are those things you have to work on as you work through your grief? They don't come in any particular order. They overlap. You can be working on more than one task at a time. And sometimes, in fact, one task will reappear later on in the process. And what we understand today is that grief is a complex experience. Grief is not an emotion. It's a complex experience that includes both emotional, physical, social, and spiritual components. And so it takes an awful lot to work through all of that. Grief affects us emotionally, not just in the ways that Kubler-Ross identified, but with remorse and regret and guilt and joy and many other emotions. In fact, as I have done pastoral care with people who are grieving, they'll come in and say, this is what I'm feeling. And I say, you're feeling what you're feeling. Yeah, but it's not one of the five stages. It's like, it's okay. It's okay. What's important is that you express those emotions and those feelings. Grief affects us physically. I remember when I got the word that my father had died, it felt like somebody had punched me in the gut. It can give us, it, it can leave us feeling exhausted physically, and you can, in fact, literally die of a broken heart. Grief can, in fact, weigh so heavily upon you and it can cause physical manifestations like heart attacks. There are social implications as we interact with people around us and that interaction changes. You know, the, the recently, a uh, person who's recently lost a spouse who suddenly stops getting invited by their couple friends? Those are social aspects of grief and spiritual aspects. Grief can either deepen our faith in God as we cling to the promises of the resurrection that we heard about just a few moments ago in the bishop's uh, sermon, or sometimes can alienate us from God as we shake our fist at God and say, why, why did you let this happen? Well, the psalmists do that too. And in the end, they always say, but God is steadfast and true. Grief is relational. That's why every single grief response that we have is different. Every experience of grief we have is different because every relationship is different. Which is why when people grieve what's happening in our churches, they come at that from lots and lots of different perspectives. Somebody who's a fairly newcomer in a congregation is gonna have a very different experience of a congregational loss than somebody who's been there a lifetime because the relationships are different. I grieve the death of my grandfather very differently than the grief of my father. And I want to confess, admit, and name, and claim that I, have prob I probably cried the hardest when my boyhood dog died. Because we were like this growing up. She was one of my best friends. 
So the relationship to the grief, to the loss, will change the way you grieve. And I think as we talk about the losses we've experienced as congregations, it's very important to remember that different people in the congregation are going to be responding to that sense of loss in very different ways. And we have to create space for us to do that, to talk about how we're experiencing the losses from our perspective and to acknowledge and honor the perspectives of others. Finally, the purpose of grief is not to sever emotional bonds with that which we've lost, but to redefine the relationship we have with the one who we've lost or the thing that we've lost. The whole separating of emotional bonds thing is Freud. Uh, Freud got a few things wrong. This is one of them. He said that what the purpose of grief was to sever emotional bonds and then transfer them to other people and other things. The reality is, is we can never fully sever emotional bonds with those things that we have loved and those people we've cared for because the only way we can truly do that is by forgetting. By forgetting them. And for the most part, we don't want to do that. And so the purpose of grief is to convert a relationship, a physical relationship with that which we have lost into one of memory. So to take the memory of my father and find a place for it in my heart, in my life, so that I can then take up life again and move on. I still remember my father. I still remember my grandfather. I still remember my dog. And they have a place in my heart and my life as I go forward. And I still think of my dad sometimes. It would have been his 87th birthday last week. And on that day I stopped and I gave thanks to God for my father's role in my life and for the way I still carry that memory and much of who he was with me. That's the purpose of grief, to help us find a place for those things which we have lost in our hearts and our lives so we can draw strength from them. And that helps us move, I think I got one more. So what we find out is that grief is not like this. It's not a nice, neat process where you follow a set of steps, you know, and then it's done. But our experience of grief is actually more a lot like this. Any of you who have grieved probably recognize that line, right? I've heard people say two steps forward, one step back in the grieving process. You know, there's good days and there's bad days. Sometimes it's one step up, one step down, one step over, turn around, spin. You know, it's just a crazy, very difficult, complex thing that we have to work through if we are to come to a place where we can hold the past in our memory and draw strength from it rather than by being trapped from it. So that brings me then to the point of today, and that is yearning and nostalgia. Let's see, how am I doing? I didn't look at what time I started. We keep moving here. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Um, I hear a lot, and, and I said this myself until I, until I started doing this research, <clears throat> the church just is trapped in nostalgia. We need to stop being so nostalgic. We need to just get over the past and get on with the future. Well, I have come to learn that that is probably one of the most unhealthy approaches to thinking about the past. In fact, I would go so far as to say that to say to a congregation, you just need to get over it and get on with it, is as cruel as saying to a parent who has just lost a child, well, you can have another baby. I mean, that's horrid. That's a horrid, awful thing to say. Or to say to somebody who has just lost their spouse of many, many years, well, you can get married again. You know, just, just forget your old spouse. Go find a new one. I mean, that's just wrong. So why are we saying that to our congregations? And I was saying that to our congregations until I started looking at this a little bit closer and learning. And I don't know how many times, and I pray God's forgiveness for the times that I have hurt a congregation by saying, just get over your past. The past is past. Let's move on. So we want to talk about the difference between yearning and nostalgia. Yearning is a common grief response that is characterized by a desire to reclaim or recreate the remembered past, which can trap us in the past if it is not resolved. Which can trap us in the past if it is not resolved. Yearning is very typical in the early days after a loss. When you lose somebody you love, you want them back. I mean, you 
desperately want them back in your life. And there's a yearning there. But over time, as you do the grief work, it moves from that deep sense of yearning to that place of memory. That's a fairly normal part of grief. But if you get stuck in your grief, if you get stuck in that yearning, it will debilitate you and prevent you from taking up life again and moving forward with your life. Nostalgia, on the other hand, let's do it that way, there we go. Nostalgia is also a common human coping mechanism that draws strength from the memory of the past, of the past experiences to help us adapt to the present and give us hope for the future. Nostalgia is a common human coping mechanism. When it was originally identified on the battlefields of Europe in the 19th century, it was seen as an illness, a sickness that needed to be cured. And that was true in terms of our understanding of nostalgia up until the middle part of the 20th century, when scholars, psychologists, and others started saying, maybe there's something more to this nostalgia thing. They've identified nostalgic thoughts in people as young as five. You know, the child who says, wow, that ball I had last week was really great. <laughs> I, I wish I could find it. <laughs> I kid you not, the research has shown that nostalgia is something we begin doing, and of course, by the time you're my age, I got lots of nostalgic thoughts um, to think about. So let's take a little closer look. This, by the way, was a, a chair that I found, found along the beach after Hurricane Katrina there in Biloxi. So, one, one of our former bishops, uh, who's now retired, said this, trying to me, trying to recreate the past is like reaching for a chocolate chip cookie at the potluck and biting into it and finding out it's a brazen. <laughs> it's a very wise bishop, <laughs> not me. Unless, of course, you really like raisin cookies, in which case you can turn it around and say, reaching for a raisin cookie and discovering it's chocolate chip. But I can't imagine anybody thinking that. <laughs> I, won't, I won't ask for a show of hands. The problem with trying to recreate the past, to give in to this sense of yearning, this need to recreate what used to be, is that the world has changed. The world around us has changed. And I don't think I need to explain that. We know that that the world is different than it was in 1980, or 1970, or 1870. And the church itself changes because the world around us changes, the context of our ministry changes. And the second reason that recreating the past is not possible is because the remembered past never really existed. The past you remember never existed because over the years you have massaged it and massaged it and massaged it and told the story so many times that while well, maybe the core of what, what happened is still there, but you, the, the memory is not real. I saw a TED talk a number of years ago where they were talking about how memory functions, and he said probably the most inaccurate memories we have are the stories that we tell over and over and over again. The most accurate memories are those, and we've all had this experience where we remember something like in a flash that we haven't thought about in years, right? We go, gosh, I hadn't just, I mean, I didn't remember that for a long time. And those are actually the most accurate memories that we have. And so when we remember how great it was when the church was full and the kids were all well-dressed and pressed and sitting neatly and quietly in their pews, um, isn't real. It isn't real. Aspects are, of it are real, but I know when I talked to my mother, she, I know I wasn't sitting quietly in my pew. <clears throat> she has a better memory of it than I, because I remember I was perfectly well behaved. <laughs> so it's really hard for us. It's really hard for us, if not impossible for us, to recreate the past. But in a minute, we'll talk about what we do with the past, if not recreate it. But I want to talk just very quickly about prolonged grief disorder. This is actually a diagnostic, um, uh, actually a, a disorder that has a diagnostic code in the psychology um, diagnostic manuals. My daughter, who is a psychologist, has confirmed this. I've actually looked it up myself. And when I start looking at the diagnostic codes for in, in, in 
for individual um, prolonged grief, grief disorder, I went, wow, that's the congregations I'm working with. So just think about your own congregation in terms of some of these symptoms of prolonged grief disorder. What happens when we're trapped in the past? That's my dog, by the way. Prolonged grief disorder can result in experiences of complicated grief, and I think that's what a lot of our churches are experiencing. So, it's prolonged grief disorder if these symptoms are persistent. Usually, in the diagnostic, co diagnostic codes, um, sometimes it's six months, sometimes it's 12 months, depends upon which code you're reading and who you're reading. But if it's persistent, if it continues over time, and for most of our congregations, sometimes these symptoms have been around for a lot longer than six months. So, preoccupation with the past. Not thinking about the past, but preoccupation with the past. Emotional numbness. I'm always a little concerned in um, a congregation where I, I say something that I thought was funny that was really funny in the last congregation was with, and the response is nothing. <laughs> you know, or, or where, where all the hymns feel like they've all the air let out of them. You know, it's not the energy that we have in this room, you know, when we were singing a little bit ago, but it's kind of like, joyful, joyful, we adore thee. <sighs> I'm sure that doesn't happen in any of your congregations. Intense sorrow and emotional pain. Bitterness or anger. That's one of the things that Kuba Ross identified, which happens in some grief processes, but certainly not all of them. But when a congregation is bitter and angry, my first question is, is tell me a story about your, your past, because there's something in there that's unresolved, that you're still carrying with you as a community, as a system. And I do find those things when we start having those conversations. Keep going here. Difficulty accepting the loss. Maladaptive appraisals about oneself. A congregation that used to be 500 members still behaving like they're 500 members when they're only 50. You know, I, I talked with one congregation one time, they could not figure out why they couldn't populate the five or six or seven or eight committees they had with the 60 people they had in, in worship. It's like, really? Um, uh, difficulty trusting others your neighboring congregation, the bishop, the synod, each other, feeling alone or detached, feeling that life is empty and meaningless. Remember, these are persistent symptoms. I mean, we all have days where we think life's pretty meaningless, right? But it's when it persists. Confusion about one's role or diminished sense of identity. We just don't know who we are anymore as a congregation. I mean, we know who we used to be. We'd really like to be that again. But we don't know who we are now. Keep going here. Difficulty with positive reminiscence. Difficulty or reluctance to pursue interests or plans for the future. We can't think about tomorrow because we're so busy thinking about yesterday. So, how do we get unstuck? This, this is a picture from my visit to Yellowstone um, in 2018. If you've ever been to Yellowstone, I was expecting a, a, a journey to the wilderness. <laughs> and I got rush hour in Tulsa. <laughs> which is not anything like rush hour in like Philadelphia, but you know, still. <laughs> how do we get unstuck? As I said, the only way to grieve is to grieve. And how do we do that? Through narrative. We are people who are defined by the stories we tell ourselves, both as individuals and as communities. And it is in the storytelling, in the talking about our experiences, sharing our memories. What do we do at funerals, right? We have the funeral liturgy, which is really important. And then we go to the fellowship hall or to the basement or wherever and we have food and we tell stories about the person who has died. And that's part of the healing process. 
In fact, one of the problems with our truncated grief process in this country is we don't go anymore to somebody's house a month out, six months out, and say, so, I really remember your husband, your wife, your partner, your son, your daughter, that person who died, and then tell a story. Because that person, because we don't want to help make them think about it, right? They're thinking about it. To say to somebody, what is it you really miss about the person that you lost? We need to be able to tell those stories to one another, to listen deeply to one another, and to work through the things that we've lost by talking about the things we've lost. To acknowledge the pain, the sadness, and the lament. I know that when I work with congregations that are moving towards holy closure and they're drawing their ministry to a close, it's really important to sit with those folks and say, you know, closing this church really sucks. And then invite them to talk about how bad they feel about that and explore that with them. It helps them to end the ministry well. Rather than saying, oh well, yeah, I know, you probably shouldn't keep going, you can find another church. People aren't ready for that at that point. At some point, yes, but... To promote social engagement, to create places and spaces where people can come together to tell their stories, to share their laments, to work together, to talk about the pain and the sorrow of whatever is going on, whether it's moving toward closure or just trying to figure out how do we do ministry in this new time with this new reality to build motivation for change, to begin to think about what can we do in the here and the now and the present that maybe excites us. It may be just a little thing. And to find and identify new aspirations for making meaning, to find meaning in who you are now. You don't start there in a grief process, but eventually at some point you get there. As you work through the, tell the narratives of your pain and your sadness and your sorrow of what you miss about what you've lost, you begin to work together and to start to say, okay, that was then. Who are we now? What assets do we have? What strengths do we have? And we'll talk about that this afternoon. So, and then that becomes a dance between dealing with loss and working through the pain of that loss and also restoration, talking about how do we begin to take life up life again and ministry and mission. And it goes back and forth. So at first, as you begin this work, you focus more on loss and less on restoration. As you go on, you focus more on the restoration and less and less on the loss. And that's the way it goes. But you don't forget the past. And so that moves us on. I'm gonna go zip through these really quick, because we're, for time, you can read about these in a book I might have written. <laughs> um, nostalgia. Oh, by the way, I'm going to go back one. I, I'm a photographer. That was my very, very first 35 millimeter camera. It's a 1950s Argus. It's a wonderful little camera. It taught me everything I know about photography. Anyway, um, the work that I, I the, the, when I discovered the power of nostalgia, it came through the work of, of this scholar and the people he works with uh, from North Dakota State University in a, a book called Nostalgia, Psychological Resources by Clay Rutledge. And I thank uh, Professor Rutledge for the amazing work he's done around nostalgia and how it works uh, in our individual lives and I think in our congregations and communities as well. So that's my, my footnote. Okay, moving on. So nostalgic memories are normal, and there's nothing wrong with them. They, in fact, can be very informative to us in terms of how we look at the world and how we engage the present and step into the future. Nostalgic memories, according to the re research that Rutledge and his colleagues have done, and they've done this work not only in uh, the United States, but they've done similar research in uh, Europe and also in Asia, uh, working with scholars in China. Um, so they've done some cross-cultural stuff. Uh, they intended on, at some point future, and I don't know if this has been done or not because I haven't had a chance to, to look at any of the newer research 
that this team has worked on. They really like to look at uh, Latin A and um, African cultures as well, but their suspicions is, is that, they, that this transcends and crosses cultural boundaries. Um, so nostalgic memories help to build social connectedness. We feel connected. Remember I said yesterday that we need this sense as human beings of continuity and our stories of the past connect us to one another and to the continuity of our own lives. And that allows us to have some strength and resilience as we move forward. If we say, gosh, God has been with us in the past, God will be with us in the present, and God will be with us in the future. And how do we know about God being with us in the past if we don't tell the stories of the ways that God was with us in the past? And so as we begin to talk about how God has walked with us for the last 200, 150, 50, or 20 years, we begin to tell the stories of our congregation and how God has been work, at work among us. That's nostalgia work. That's healthy nostalgia work, as long as we don't get stuck in it. So it promotes social connectedness. It promotes self-awareness and self-esteem. Self-awareness in that we need to know our stories, both as individuals, I mean, it'd be a little weird if you forgot your entire story from this moment on and as if it never happened, right? I mean, we, we call that dementia. I mean, we need to know our stories, where we've come from, how we've gotten here, the people who have influenced us, and how they've influenced us, and why, and how we carry those memories with us. I am so, so grateful, for example, for the campus pastors who shaped and molded my faith uh, when I was in college. I don't want to forget that. I also don't want to dwell there. Because if all I wanted to do is recreate my college days, have you ever seen a 60-year-old trying to recreate their college days? <laughs> it's really sad. <laughs> but I own and I value that time um, and carry that with me. So it makes me self-aware, but it also, nostalgia also contributes to our self-esteem. If we did it once, we can do it again. If we did it once, we can do it again. You know, if, if years ago we were serving the community around us, it means we can serve the community around us again, because we did it before. Now, maybe we did it differently when there were 250 of us, and we have to do it differently when there are just 50 of us. But you know, Jesus did an awful lot with a handful of guys in a, or a, a 12 guys and a handful of women. Of course, we know who did all the work, right? <laughs> I, I was just talking to somebody the other day, and we were talking about the Last Supper, and you know, Da Vinci's picture of the Last Supper with the guys all sitting around the table, and the person said to me, Bishop, did you ever wonder who cooked that meal? <laughs> the women were there. Um. <clears throat> And in fact, the Gospels even say that in the upper room, it was the disciples and the women who were with them. So uh, if you think that there were no female disciples, you're wrong. <clears throat> they were there, and they were very much a part of Jesus' ministry. But if we did it before, we can do it again. We may have to do it differently. We may have to do it in a different way because we're in a different configuration. We don't have to recreate the past, but we can draw strength from the past for the sake of moving into the future. The past can help us find meaning and significance. We can mine the past for what our core values are as God's people, the church. And that, those core values that were reflected are those, still those things that lie at the heart and the center of your, of your congregation. They're still there. They may be packaged different. They may need to be packaged different. They may need to be shaped differently. But the core of who you are is still there. Our most nostalgic story as the people of God, is the story of the cross and the resurrection. We tell that nostalgic story over and over and over and over again every single year. We don't want to recreate the first century, although Christians have been trying to do that for 2,000 years. But that's what stands at the heart and the core of who we are as the church. So if we are supposed to forget the past, we turn our back on who we are. And so the question always is, is 
how was God at work in us in those days, in the good old days, in the used to be's? And how can that help us see how God is at work with us and among us in the here and the now? And how can it build confidence in the fact that God will be with us tomorrow and the next day and the day after that? But until you get through the grief of the loss, you can't begin to tap those stories in a way that give life, in a nostalgic way, instead of a way of yearning. And give us a sense of vitality. Wow, you know, we've done some really great things as a congregation. We can celebrate that. I love celebrating anniversaries with congregations. We sit around, we tell the stories of all the great ways that God has worked in and through us as a church. And then we can say, gosh, look at all the ways that God is at work in and through us as a church. Now, I, was, I did a little exercise with a congregation um, a, a few years ago. We were all sitting around, and I said to the congregation, when was this congregation at its best? And so they went around, and the people who had been there a long, long time, you know, said, well, in 1950, and oh, in, in, in 1983 when we were doing this, and they told stories about that. And finally, one of the newcomers piped up and said, he had been in the congregation a couple of years, he said, I think this congregation's at its best right now. And everybody went, what? <laughs> and he said, why do you think I joined the church? This is a great community of faith. And they all went, Oh, I guess it is, <laughs> you know? Um, so um, that's why it's important to tell those stories. Um, but he heard, he could hear all the great things his congregation had been about in the past, and instead of saying, well, I'm going to yearn to recreate that, he says, you know, all that stuff is still going on right now. Look at it, I can see it. <laughs> Sometimes we have to listen to somebody that's new to hear the stories of our past in a new way. So, nostalgia contributes to a sense of belonging, and there is a crisis of belonging um, off in, our, in our country this day, especially upon our young people. Um, it, it, it usually gets said um, there's a, 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 a crisis of loneliness, but loneliness is the opposite of belonging. And by belonging, I don't mean becoming members. I mean being a part of a community of faith, a place where people feel welcomed and loved and cared for and supported, not a name on an organizational membership list. Nostalgia contributes. So, you know, when, when you have new people come in, if you do have new people come in, um, make sure they know something about the story of your church. Tell them the story of who you are and where you've been. Help integrate them into that story and then say, we are so glad that you have come among us now to share your gifts and your skills and your perspectives and bring that new vision, bring that new vision into this community of faith. It raises optimism. Again, if we did it before, we can do it again. It's like the child who moves into a new school district and says, I'm never going to make any friends here. And um, the parents say to the child, well, you had friends in the last school. Think about how, you, how you, know, you were good at making friends there. You can make friends now. And the kid usually says, yeah, right. And then goes out and makes friends because they believe they can do it. Raises optimism. It evokes inspiration. Instead of trying to recreate the past, tap into those things that made that good and let that inspire you to try new things, to experiment in new ways. At some point, all of your congregations experimented with something. <laughs> Right? You tried something new. At some point, somebody founded your congregation. Imagine what they would have done if they had gotten to, to the place where you are and said, ah, you know, the church back in Europe was really great. We'll never get one started here. Right? At some point, somebody in your congregation has been an innovator, a creative person, an inspired person who has tried something new, probably failed a time or two, and eventually God blessed them and created the churches that you belong to today. That's still possible. That's still possible. If we can tap into those memories and find strength in those memories rather than just trying to yearn for the past, 
the church can find a new source for vitality. And even if a congregation ultimately decides it's time to bring their ministry to a close, everybody that's a part of that congregation, even if it's just a half a dozen of you, carry all of those nostalgic memories with you to the next community of faith. And that can be a gift. And the life of the congregation that you belong to will continue to live on in you and in the lives of the people that you touched over all those centuries or decades of mission and ministry of all the people whose lives you touch after that congregation's ministry comes to a close and yet continues in you as you go on to whatever the next community is that God calls you to. Nostalgia can boost creativity. I like this um, quote from um, uh, Saul Bellow from his 1970 no novel, Mr. Samler's Planet. Nostalgic memories keep the wolf of insignificance from the door. Nostalgic memories keep the wolf of insignificance from the door. Because our memories tell us who we are, not just who we've been, but who we are and who we will be. The story of who God has been among us and how God has led us and directed us and guided us in the past helps us to remember that God loves us most of all for Jesus' sake. Reminds us that God continues to walk with us and will continue to walk with us no matter what tomorrow holds, even beyond death and into life itself. And so as we embrace God's future, I, I love the image of the bicycle wheel. Now, I don't know if you're bicyclist, you understand this, but if you don't really know much about bicycles, I used to do a, a lot of bicycle riding when, when I was a, a lot younger, um, and I did a lot of work on my own bikes. And the way a bicycle work, wheel works, if you don't know this, is the spokes hold the wheel in tension, and the way that you get a, a wheel to quit from wobbling or hopping is by adjusting the tension on the spokes. So you turn a little bit on this one, and you turn a little on that one, and you work your way around the wheel until it's back in true. Um, there's a little stand, it's called truing stand, and you use a little tool to do that. And you're constantly, you know, every time I hit a rain, train track or something, I have to go home and get the thing back and around. Um, and I think that's one of my metaphors for life, that we're constantly in the business of truing our tire so that we can continue turning and moving into the future. And so we all, um, as human beings, and I think as congregations, need a sense of continuity a connection with the past, that's the function of nostalgic memories. But we also need a spirit of innovation and experimentation as we draw strength from those memories to step into the future. We need to both acknowledge our losses and our grief, but we also need to be looking forward to the new life that God in Christ is always calling us to. And those two things need to be in tension. And if all we're doing is looking to the future and not remembering our past, the wheel will get out of round. If all we're doing is saying, you know, what's the, I had a member used to say, I don't know, but do we want to become the church of what's happening now? <laughs> or do we want to stay rooted in who we are? She and I had lots of arguments. Um, but she's in some cases right. If all we're doing is looking at what's the latest fad, what's the latest thing that somebody says, this is going to get your church to grow. If you just do this, you just do that, and you lose track of the past, the wheel is not going to be in round. On the other hand, if all you're doing is yearning for the past, wanting to recreate the past, again, you'll forget and you'll miss the wonderful things that God is doing among you in the here and now and not be able to hear how God is calling you into the future, into the future that God is always calling us to. My siblings in Christ, the fullness of the kingdom does not lie in the past, though it was revealed fully in the past in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. The scriptures tell us again and again that the fullness of the kingdom lies in the future. Which means that while God has walked with us faithfully down through the years, the reality is, is God is always calling us into the fullness of the kingdom which lies in the future. And God is at work in you in the here and in the now.
We're going to talk about the, that future and how we step into that future uh, this afternoon. And so I think that's maybe, I, whoop, that's the last one.